Hi everyone, my name is Medina Sethi and I am the Continuing Education Coordinator here at Microdental Laboratories. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for our one hour hosted CE webinar on a closer look at oral sleep devices with CEO and co-founder, Mr. David Walton of Respire, a whole U lab. Um, before we begin, I'd like to go over a couple things regarding CE. Uh, please be sure to stay for the entire duration of the webinar uh, in order to receive your CE credits. Uh, minutes of your attendance will be uh, recorded. Also, um, once the webinar has completed and you've exited out of Zoom, there will be a browser instructing you to complete a CE evaluation form. Please be sure to do that as well in order to receive your CE credit. Um, if for whatever, whatever reason it does not appear, um, go ahead and email me directly and I will send you a link to that. Um, during the presentation, you will have the opportunity to ask David questions in the Q&A section of Zoom. Um, he will get to these questions once uh, he has concluded his presentation. And um, if he misses your question for whatever reason due to time, you can email him and he will uh, follow up with you. Also, uh, lastly, the entire program will be recorded and uploaded onto Microdental's website uh, one week from today. So you'll have access to that um, whenever you'd like. Also, there's um, plenty of older webinars that we have saved on there if you have time to check those out as well. Uh, so without further delay, I'll turn the program over to David. Uh, David, you now have the Zoom stage. Thank you. Great, thank you, Medina. Thanks for everyone for joining tonight. Um, I know that everyone may be having a little bit of a webinar fatigue uh, due to COVID. I know you guys have been on a lot of webinars, so hopefully I can keep this interesting for you. So what I would like to do is, is really do a deeper dive into oral appliances and not just talk about the basics, but talk about some of the, the problems, um, some of the troubleshooting that you can do. And I think what's ultimately important with these devices is how to customize them to your patients and your practice. So. Hopefully it's interesting for you guys. Um, as I say, I'm available for questions before or after, sorry, during or after the presentation. Um, but just to kind of do a little bit of an introduction. So obviously there's a lot of brands on the screen there. Um, you know, Hoyu you and, and Respire is essentially where, where I'm coming from. And we're here to support Microdental and Modern USA. So we have a range of appliances to, to suit you guys. Um, and obviously your different our different locations around the country to help service your offices. So within, within the team, there is a lot of support. This is a support network for you. Um, and I'm here to kind of kick things off to try and help move things forward for you guys. So to go just to a little bit of, um, a little bit about myself. So I'm the CEO of Respire Medical, which is a whole U company. And we are the designer and, and also the manufacturer of the oral, oral sleep devices that we'll talk about tonight. Um, so, we don't have to talk too much about me. That's pretty boring stuff, pretty standard stuff. But we have you know, a range of devices just to kind of touch on those first. The, the, the main devices that we have that we'll run through can all be customized in some way. And that's really what I want to get at tonight is like, how do we customize them and how do we make them fit not only your patients, but make them fit your, your practice and what it is that you guys are looking to achieve with your patients. So to run through the first few, this is our signature device. This is the Respire Blue Plus. So the benefits with this design are that it's not connected, first of all. So the patient has the ability to put the upper piece in, put the lower piece in, get comfortable, and it's not holding them together. Now, some devices, and even some of the devices we'll talk about tonight, have um, a connection between the upper and the lower. And we'll talk about that and the benefits to that. But the benefit to this device is that the patient doesn't feel it, so they need to be locked together in any way. So that's the first benefit. The second benefit is that the, um, we have a four wing design in this, new, in, the, in this new product. So the four wing design is essentially used to strengthen the device when it's put under lateral forces during, during bruxism. So traditionally with the dorsal fin design, um, and, and our traditional device also had this, is that when you have two dorsal fins on either side, as the patient's going into lateral excursions, it can put a lot of pressure onto those dorsal fins. By adding those solid blocks of acrylic coming down from the upper, what that's allowing it to do is to stabilize the, the, the strength or the stress that's going onto the arm. So it's ultimately, it's distributing the forces around the device and not just putting all of the stress onto the, onto the adjustable wings. So it has an adjustment mechanism inside of this device, which has um, a screw mechanism, sorry, a welded mesh mechanism that's fixed to the screw before it goes inside of the device. So it's not a matter of just laying the mesh on top of the acrylic, it's actually welded to the screw to add that durability. 
and then you'll see also some other strengthening components in there. So this is probably, we feel so the strongest that we can make this device. It, it, as I say, it's our signature device. It's what we started the company with 10 years ago uh, when, we, when we started Respire. And it's been a great, great product. A lot of our clients use this exclusively. Um, you know, some of the other benefits that you have, it has up to, up to, up to six millimeters of advancement. So that's six millimeters from the starting position. It's available with a hard material or a hard soft. We'll get into more details on that later. And then we also have some optional extras of elastic hooks and then an anterior discluding element to take the pressure off the posterior. And we'll talk about those in more detail soon too. So the next one is the Respire Blue EF and the EF stands for Endurance Framework. So the biggest point about this device is yes, it has great strength because it has a core material inside there, but the biggest thing is the tongue space. And ultimately, when, with any type of sleep device, we're trying to bring the jaw forward to create more space for the tongue so it can open up the airway. So this, this material that we use, this chrome material, is almost the thinnest material you could get without it being too brittle. You know, we could make acrylic, you know, less than a millimeter thick, but it's simply going to break. So having that chrome material allows us to keep it as thin and as small as possible to maximize the tongue space. Now you'll see from the image on the right hand side here that this is showing it from the lingual side and it's showing how you how there's no acrylic in the anterior ultimately again to, to give that tongue more space and on the lingual it's actually a reduced lingual so it shortens the lingual just past the height of contour so it's just enough to engage the undercut without being excessive enough to encroach on the tongue space so all this also has the four wing design as i said and as a standard, it comes with that reduced lingual coverage. So it's also adjustable up to six millimeters. Um, it has the durability of a chrome device. And then again, the options of the elastic hooks and the anterior discluding element too. So the next device, devices I should say to talk about are our Respire Pink line. Now, all of the pink devices are covered by Medicare. So I mean, anybody who's either treating Medicare or is looking to treat Medicare patients, you know, the volume is certainly a very attractive for those, for, for getting into treating those types of patients. But the challenge is that you're only allowed to use specific devices. And, and, and Medicare uh, it works with um, the PDAC organization and PDAC approved the devices that can be billed under Medicare. So all of the devices that I'm about to show you are all on that list from Medicare. So the benefit to this device, this herp style, hinge style design is that it allows for more lateral movement than, than a lot of devices. So this is important if you have a patient who has bruxism and specifically sleep bruxism. So if you have that patient and they have some TND concerns, you really don't wanna lock them in a position where they really can't move because the synovial fluid will, will lock around the jaw and when they wake up in the morning, they're not gonna be able to move their jaw quite as much. So the essentially this is allowing that freedom of movement so the, door, the jaw doesn't lock and that synovial fluid can move around the joint, joint of the condyle just to give that patient that freedom that they need, certainly if they are um, a, a bruxing patient. So the, the, next, the, the next advantage of this is that it has an adjustment screw inside of the arm. So it has up to five millimeters of this advancement. It's also available in the hard and hard soft fitting surfaces that we'll touch on later. And also has the option for the elastic hooks and the anterior discluding mount. And then we can also do what's called a reduced lingual coverage on this device. Now, with, with any device that we can do this with, the reduced lingual is essentially taking away the acrylic on the lingual to create more tongue space. That, that's the basics of it. Now, it can be more complex than that because not every patient you can do this for. Some patients who have quite small teeth, quite small undercuts, certainly on the, on the lingual of the lower, that's where we'll usually get a lot of retention from these devices. So you have to be quite selective in who you choose that reduced lingual coverage for. And I have a few slides to explain that in a, coming up in a few slides time. So the next device is the, the kind of the combination of what we've seen with the pink hinge style combined with the endurance framework of the Chrome, the EF design. So you, you're getting a very, very doable device here. It has that freedom of lateral movement. It has the Chrome material for strength. And it also has that reduced tongue space with that thin material. So the reduced lingual coverage comes as a standard with all of the EF designs. The reduced coverage on the anterior teeth 
also um, uh, creates space because no, there's no acrylic in the anterior. But, but one point that's important to talk about here is that because on the facial um, of the teeth, there's no acrylic there. So that encourages um, lip seal and it prevents you know, the lips being uh, held open and we'll talk about the, the importance of lip seal and why that's important coming up. But this device is, has a very low profile, um, very small footprint, certainly on the facial and, and around the lingual. So if you're looking for a device for a patient who has that small amount or a larger tongue, which a lot of sleep apnea patients do, then this is a very suitable device for those types of patients. Again, of course, it has the lateral movement that you have with all of our hinge devices approved for Medicare, up to five millimeters of advancement. And of course, the options of the elastic hooks and the anterior discreening end. The next device is the Peak Micro. So this is a smaller hinge. It's around 20% shorter than a standard hinge arm that you might have seen on some other herpes devices. So why is that important? Essentially, if you have a patient who has a small mouth, who has maybe four bicuspid extractions, or, or you just, you're worried that it's going to catch their lips, using this design, it allows you to use a Medicare-approved device um, that also has a hinge mechanism, but it's just a little bit shorter than the, than the regular hinge um, that we would use. Now, because it is shorter, it ha only has three millimeters of advancement inside of the screw. So if you get to the end of that three millimeters and you need to go further, we've added an extra fixing element on the upper component. So if you max out at the three millimeters, you simply unscrew the upper, move it forward one notch, wind the screw back, and then you can go forward another three millimeters. So in, in, in essence, you have a three millimeters plus three millimeters, so six millimeters, of course, of, of advancement for, with this device in total. So you get the lateral movement, shorter arms for patients with a smaller mouth, and it has that six millimeters, and again, all of the other, all of the other options that, I, that we discussed on the other devices. So the next device is the kind of the kind of the most premium device that we have. It's kind of a combination of everything. You have the lateral movement, you have the hinge arms, you have the extra fixing element to go further. You have the smaller arms, so it's more comfortable. You have the extra tongue space, you have that chrome material. So there's a lot of features in this device. It's kind of like the all-in-one device, if you'd like, and certainly more of our, our premium device. But everything we discussed on the previous devices it, it, encourage, it, it entails this inside of this final product. So just to move on from these, we also have a new product, a new Medicare approved device that we're gonna be launching on September 5th. This device has a new titration key, so it's easier to adjust the device moving it forward. It has a unique adjustment mechanism, which is a very innovative design of how you move it forward with more advancement. And it also comes with a three-year warranty. And from September 15th, all, all of the devices will come with, with a three-year added warranty. So we're going to have a launch event, which we'll share information with you um, as we get closer to it. Um, and the launch event will showcase this new device and all of its features. So hopefully you can join us for that, for that launch. <clears throat> so just as a summary, if you have a patient who you're looking, who needs that freedom of, of movement to open and close the devices, all of the devices allow that freedom of movement, but the Respire Blue is certainly the best version because it is not connected. Patients with a larger tongue, really it's the EF devices, those chrome material where you can get it super thin yet without you losing any of the durability. Bruxing patients, any of the herps, any of the hinge devices that you see on the right hand side there. Um, then we also have the patients with a smaller mouth. We're really gonna go with the micro version there. You certainly use the EF for those as well because of that thin material. We're using that small hinged arm reduces the hardware that the patients are putting in their mouth. And then Medicare approved, actually all of the, all of the uh, pink devices, I know it doesn't have it on the pink EF micro, but all of those designs are approved for Medicare as is the new device we're releasing next month. Okay, so now we've got the appliances out of the way, let's get through to the kind of the nitty gritty to talk a little bit about more of the details around sleep apnea in general and, and some of the, the, the modifications that could be made. So we did some clinical data on the devices. So we did a study of around 82 patients, a kind of almost an even mix between male and female patients. And the average male BMI um, was 25 and the average age was 67. So and then the average pre-AHI, so again, sorry if I'm explaining something that people already know, but 
the apnea hypopnea index is what is used to diagnose the patients, whether they have mild, moderate, or severe sleep apnea. So again, I'm, I don't, I'm sure most people are aware of that, so I won't go into too many details around that. And then the oxygen desaturation is probably, uh, in my opinion, probably a more accurate reading of the quality of patient sleep um, than, than the AHI is. But again, we'll, we'll not get into kind of the politics behind that, but we, look, we looked at both. We looked at the AHI to see how many times they stopped breathing, and then we looked at the oxygen desats to see how low their oxygen, blood oxygen level would get during the night's work of sleep. So the post AHI, the average went down to four. So from 32, which is severe sleep apnea, down to four, which is, which is less than mild. Zero to five is, is, um, is sorry, five to 15 is, is mild. 15 to um, 25, sorry, my mind just slipped there. And then anything above 30 is, is severe. So we got the patients down from 32 um, average AHI down to four. So that somewhat validates the, the data in terms of are the devices successful? And I know that certainly on the medical community, there, there's a lot of questions of, can the dentist treat these patients successfully with these devices? Hence why we, we show this clinical data to back up the science behind the devices. So to look more specifically at the data, these are kind of patient by patient. Now, if you look at the pre-AHIs on there, that's the column uh, one from the right, um, you'll see there's some very severe ones in there. There's an 88 and 87.1. Now, what we're talking about there is the patient stopping breathing for 10 seconds or more, 88 times on average every hour, not through the whole night of sleep, just every hour. So those are really, really severe patients. And that's really the patients that, that you could have the most successful success with. Now, the gold standard for those patients is CPAP. And CPAP can work very well for those patients. But if the CPAP doesn't work for those patients, then I've seen oral appliance work for those patients better than it would for even the mild to moderate patients, which, the, which is what the devices are regulated by the FDA for. So we look at the post AHIs, and let's see where those got down to. So if you look at the two guys in the middle, where it was 88 and 87 AHI, those got down to 12 and 9 AHI respectively. So you know, stopping breathing nine to 12 times on average every hour is, is certainly not curing the device, the, curing the disease. We're, we're certainly not trying to cure anything here, but it's, this is what's really changing people's lives. If you can take that, if you can take a patient from 88 down to 12 or even a nine, that's a huge success. Um, and you also see the type of devices we use here. It wasn't really for any other reason. A lot of these were the respite pain devices, the type style design that we used. Um, it just really was patient selection of what we chose them for. Um, to give you a little bit of an indication of what doctors are using, it's, I would say it's around about 60% of our doctors are using um, the herbs that respire pink for their patients, and the other 40% are using more of the dorsal fin designs. And we can talk a little bit more uh, coming up of why that is and how to select those devices. But this just, I wanted to show this just to give some kind of confidence and some clinical data behind the devices. So by registration, probably the most critical part of the whole treatment is the by registration. Now, again, I'm sure that a lot of you have, have taken sleep bites and, and I don't want to you know, pr you know, preach to the choir as it were, but there's, the, there's many different ways to take the bite. And the two that I would recommend are the George Gage on the left-hand side or the Airway Metrics um, on the right-hand side. Now, both companies are separate from, from us. Where we're a very different company, um, but just two that I would recommend. You know, I think one, one thing that I really like about the Airway Metrics um, is that it, it's giving you a, a more of an educated guess as to where to, to position the jaw. The, the George gauge is more giving you an average position. So if you say that the patient can advance 10 millimeters forward and you want to set them at 50% of that protrusion, then you're going to move them forward five millimeters and take the bite. With the airway metrics, it's slightly different. So you'll use this ruler kind of looking device on the lower right here. And what that's doing is giving you a ballpark position. So the way you use this is the patient would bite down onto the first position, have them lie back in a supine position, ask them to make the snore sound. If you feel as so though it's, it's reduced the snore sound, then great, you might have found the position. 
but then you go to the next millimeters, which is eight millimeters, and then maybe to 12, and it gives you an idea of where you need to be to reduce that snore sound, which is giving you the indication of is the airway opening up. Now, on, on the upper right here, you'll see the, uh, the titration keys, as they're called, and this is really refining the position. So if you think, okay, six millimeters is six to eight millimeters is where I roughly need to be, then you can use these jigs to have the patient bite onto different protrusive positions and even different vertical positions. And again, ask them to make the snore sound and you'll be able to hear if the, the, if the snore sound is reduced, which is in turn opening up the airway. The, the really good part about this, this technique is the patients get really engaged in their treatment. So if you're asking the patient to lie down in a supine position, make a snore sound, they'll really go for it. But then if you put them in a position where they can't make that snore sound, you don't really have to say anything else. They know that that position is going to stop their snoring, it's going to open up their airway, airway and hopefully it's going to help treat their sleep apnea. So we have a supporting video on this where it's, it's a six minute video that you can run through and it shows you the techniques. Um, it was done by, I believe, Dr. Nicole Chenet in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and she kind of runs through it. She's one of the key opinion leaders of the industry and she can walk you through that. I was gonna show it tonight, but I know your time is valuable. I don't wanna have you guys sit through a six minute video. Certainly some of you guys might already be aware of, of that system, but happy to share those videos after. So things to look out for. Certainly when taking the bite, this is the one thing that we see every day from experienced dentists to, to guys just getting started and it's the midline shifts. Now, there's several reasons for this. Um, Obviously, you're moving the patient into an unnatural position and you're asking to hold them there for a few minutes, maybe not a few minutes, maybe a minute, while the material sets. So you, not only are you bring them into a position, you're trying to hold them there, then they have to stay still. So if they move, which they often do, then, then that is going to cause a midline shift. Now, I must say that some patients do have a natural deviation to one side. And, and please let the lab know if you're sending in a bite or it is a natural deviation, just so they don't you know, reach out to you guys and bother you too much with asking you if this is correct or not. But I would say around about five to 10% of the cases that we get in each day have a midline shift for, for one of those reasons. So one thing is actually to, just to talk about on the, uh, on the midline shift is there's a few kind of techniques that I would recommend to, to avoid this or at least to check it. So as the patient's coming forward, and uh, you're, you're about to place the material in to take, take the bite registration, have the patient press their tongue forward. This really has uh, two benefits. The first is that it presses the material that you're putting in there, presses that against the teeth, so you get better indentations of the bite registration. Um, but the second is it's, it's also quite hard for the patient to deviate to one side while pressing their tongue forward. So just the tongue muscle moving forward can help you know, line that jaw up, but certainly the other benefit of pressing the material against the teeth is a really important one for the, for the lab. So moving on to the next thing, something to look out for is the curve of speed. So, excuse me, the, <clears throat> something that, again that we see often is that, that, that we'll receive a bite where in the anterior it maybe has four millimeters, six millimeters, and then it's sent to the lab and the doctor may say, well, yeah, it has enough anterior space, make it at that position. But what it doesn't have is enough material in the, enough space in the posterior. Now, why that's important is because the devices that we provide have a flat plane of occlusion. And if you need to get that flat plane of occlusion in there, you're going to need around at least two millimeters um, on the upper, two millimeters on the lower in the posterior. So we have two options there. We can either increase the vertical. When you take the bite, you can increase the vertical. Or the other option, which is probably one of the more popular is to place mesial occlusal rests on the mesial of the last molar. So if we look at that, it's essentially not covering the distal, but by doing that, you'll be able to reduce the vertical and keep them at the vertical that you desired. Now, why is that important? The reason that that's important is because of lip seal. And in a few slides time, I'll talk about why lip seal is so important, but it's really, really important that you select a device and take, take the bite registration in a position that, that is um, allowing lip seal. So by reducing this vertical, keeping it on the mesial will, will allow you to do that in most cases. 
Now, you're certainly going to have cases where that curve of speed is really too high and you are going to have to increase the vertical. Certainly as that lower jaw moves forward, that, that the distal of that last molar is going to come forward and slide forward and hit the, hit the upper teeth. So um, there is certain cases where you have to increase the vertical, but it, if you can minimize it, then great. I think, again, just, just some anecdotal evidence for you guys is the majority of our clients, I would say, are sending a bite at around about six millimeters is, I would say, the average. We get some coming in at four. We get some coming in at you know six, eight, even 10, and even sometimes above that. But I would say the average is around about that five or six millimeter mark um, on the vertical. But it, it, again, just because you have that space in the anterior doesn't mean that you have the space in the posterior. So then it's really something that, that we see in the lab all of the time. And, and it really delays production because we have to go back and check with you whether you want the mesial rest or the increase in vertical. So something to keep an eye on um, as you're taking those. So this is how the mesial rests look on the device. So as it states here, it can be used on a high curve of speed. Also, if you're unable to get the detail of the last molar, like we all know it's difficult to get that impression right back to the distal. And if you don't get the right detail and the lab has to guess where that tooth ends or, or where the gingival margin starts on the distal of the tooth, and they have to guess that, then it can cause the device to have the bite be off or the, um, or the fit just not be fitting, sitting down correctly. So it's also helpful, as I said, if you can't get the detail of the last molar on the, uh, on the impression. Also, if you have a patient who's a gagging patient and you really don't want to put too much material back there, bringing that acrylic forward and just placing it on the mesial to prevent any super eruption and to kind of stabilize that last molar is another good option. And, and obviously uh, patients with a larger tongue. So combining the reduced lingual coverage that we talked about before with the uh, mesial rest can certainly um, be a big benefit for those types of patients. Here it is on the EF, on the, on the chrome framework design. And you'll see here, this is, this is about as much as we could reduce the lingual on, on any device. You know, it has the, re the reduced lingual coverage there. You can barely even see the coverage on the lingual. And then it doesn't cover that, that last molar, the distal of the last molar. So this is very suitable for those patients who have gag reflex or a larger tongue or a narrow arch or anything that you need to create more space inside the box. So just to re-emphasize there what I was referring to with, with positioning those. So <clears throat> another thing is the reverse curve of speed. So this patient has some really big crowns back there. And now if you look in the anterior, now, yes, this is a digital case, so we can measure it. So it's, it's almost nine millimeters of, a, of vertical. Now, you really probably wouldn't want to go much further than that because you're going to lose lip seal beyond that point. But what, what this is showing is that even with that eight millimeters, it's always important to check the space in the posterior before you take that bite because certainly on the patient's right there, there's, there's not a lot of space and we certainly don't want to increase it any, any more than, any than 8.7 millimeters. So for this patient, I would certainly recommend uh, those mesial, mesial occlusal rests. So some of the bite issues that we see, this is on certainly not in digital cases, but on, on more the traditional is on the left-hand side here, this is really something to avoid where the, the tray has been loaded in the anterior, but there's nothing in the posterior. So when the lab goes to mount the models on the articulator, it's, it's gonna cause the rock inside of the bite register, inside of the, uh, the appliance. So the models really need that stability like it has on the right-hand side here. The good thing here is there's a lot of definition. It covers the full occlusal surface. There's no guesswork for the lab. They can put the models in there. There's no rock, there's no bounce. It can really, it can really, um, it can really stabilize where the bite is. The one in the middle, this isn't really much of a bite registration at all, um, but yeah, please, please, please. The, lab would, the lab would be grateful if you would not send that in, that would be very nice. Um, so the 3D process. So I, I'm not sure how many of you guys are using scanners. Um, there's around 60% of our clients that, that are using scanning uh, right now. Um, the lab accepts all, all scans, of, co of course. So we, you can connect to the lab quite seamlessly through, through pretty much any platform. But the bite registration process is slightly different. So this is one technique. You may have your own, and, and I think everybody has their own technique, but this is one way to take the bite registration when you're scanning. So first of all, take the bite as you usually would with the airway metrics or the George gauge, and then cut away the posterior segments. So you're cutting it into three portions. 
Um, oops, sorry, the, the animations were slightly off there. So you cut it into three, three sections and then have the patient bite onto that anterior section and then scan one side, go into the other side and scan the other. And then the software should be able to map the bite. Now, some people have a technique of cutting it down the middle. If you're using the George gauge, it's quite hard to do that because there is the fork in the middle there. But the one thing that I'm not a big fan of, of just cutting it down the middle, scanning one, taking it out and putting the other side in, is because as you scan that one side, if you need to scan the other side, like some softwares do need to scan both sides. So if you take that out and then have the patient put in the other side, if they've moved very, very slightly, you're really never going to know. And the lab's never going to know either because it's going to be so small that you're not going to notice until you get the, 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 the device back and you go to insert it and the bite's off because there's been some movement, whether it's been some tipping or, or, or tilting of the, of the occlusal table, and you're never going to know that. So that's why I like just putting that anterior piece in. The patient doesn't have to take things out. They don't have to move. Just have to hold still while you scan the, uh, the premolars on, on the right and then on the left. And then the software can map, can map that, um, that, that, uh, that position. So just before we go on to the next slide. So if you do need to connect with the lab, um, if you search within your software, within your platform, for the MDL, um, a modern Dental Lab, excuse me, Modern Dental Laboratory at Troy, Michigan. Um, and if you connect there, you should be able to connect with, you know, Three Shape, uh, Carestream, whatever it is that you guys are using. Um, you know, people often ask me what I recommend in terms of the scanners. I would say that the Three Shape is probably the, the best quality that we have. But I would say that most doctors are using the Carestream. I think it's probably the most popular. Um, iTero is, is obviously popular because a lot of doctors are doing Invisalign too. Um, so I would say those three are the most popular, but in terms of quality of scans, I, I think 3Shape probably has the slight lead on everyone. Um, it's also probably the more expensive device. So um, those, those three are the ones that I would recommend. Edentulous patients, what do we do for these guys? Now, there's a few options here. Um, one is that we could make the device on top of the dentures. So you just simply take an impression of the dentures, take the bite as you normally would, send it off to the lab. The, the challenge with that is that then the patient is wearing, you know, essentially four prosthesis in the mouth. They have the upper and lower denture and then the upper and lower sleeper plane. And that, that may be a lot for the patients. It may not be, it may be work. You know, certainly the, the easier side for, from the clinical side of this is that you have all of the reference points of the dentures meaning that you have the incisal edge, you have the midline, you have the lip line. So you don't really have to, to do a lot of work in terms of taking the bite, excuse me. The, the, this is a slightly different way, a little bit more time consuming, but let me kind of talk you through this. So essentially what we have on the left hand, here, left -hand side here are some occlusal rims that are made um, kind of like as, exactly as you would have did as a denture. What's, what's important to note here though, is that the upper rim needs to have the same measurement as the upper denture. Because if the incisal edge is not at the same position on the wax rim as it is on the denture, when you're taking the measurements to move them forward three, four millimeters, you know, whatever it may be, you don't actually know if you're moving them forward three millimeters because you don't know if the incisal edge is accurate. So um, having the lab make it exactly to the, to, the, to, the, to the incisal edge of the denture with the midline mark is, is really very, very, very important to do. Now for those, I, my history as is, is a denture, I was a clinical technician in the UK before I moved to the US. Um, so my history is in denture. So for you guys who are doing the dentures, doing, doing dentures a lot, excuse me, then there's the, the wax copy technique of dentures where you essentially copy the dentures in wax. That's a great technique to use. Um, or there's also tools like the armor gauge, which help you measure the incisor papilla to the incisal edge, so the lab can replicate the the, the blocks there for you. Um, so that's that, that's one option. And then we would make the device to fit into the dental space there. Um, now, it looks quite big and quite bulky, but essentially we need to open it up more than the denture. So it needs to, if the dentures say at their, their centric position, we do need to open them a little bit more than that centric position. So that's why it looks a little bit 
kind of big and a little bit scary, but it's essentially taking up the space of the denture plus a little bit to increase the, increase the vertical. Um, so the bite is, is difficult and it's a little bit more time consuming to do it this way. Um, the fitting surface, the patient, again, from, from the denture guys out there, the, getting a patient used to a new fitting surface can often be a challenge. And I think that's why a lot of dentists actually do make it right on top of the dentures. Um, and it's because it still takes up the same space as the denture, just we also have to factor in what the sleep device needs. So there's one other technique, and this is quite a tricky technique, but I do think it's probably the most accurate. So um, here we have an indentures model and the impression of the denture. Now, please don't send these to the lab and say, can you put the model on the, the denture on top of the model of the edentulus and make it that way because the model on the left is never going to fit on top of the model on the right. So please, I'd recommend not to do that. Um, it's happened before. Um, so what we would do in this scenario is you would do um, a, a, a suck down of some sort, whether you, whatever the type of Urkelock material, or Biostar, whatever you have, do the suck down on top of the denture part and then cut that out. So essentially you have a, a suck down of the denture and then you place the, the denture, the, the, the kind of the suck down of the denture um, back in the patient's mouth. Now, what you have here is you have the midline, you have the incisal edge. So now you can go back and take your bite registration, knowing that you're moving it forward the correct amount of millimeters. So you're getting all the reference points of the denture without actually having the denture. And then the lab can take this, mount it just as it is there, take that suck down away, and then make the device right on top of it. So this is the, the technique that I was working on with uh, Dr. Richard Dunn uh, in, uh, in New York. Very, very smart guy, very nice dentist as well, very knowledgeable in the sleep space. Uh, and him and I worked on this and it turned out a really, really successful case for the patient. And I think what, what's important to note is that it was successful from the get-go. There wasn't any kind of, okay, I've said the midline incorrectly, I've set the incisal edge incorrectly, we're going to have to rework it. it. It fits straight away, and the patient was very, very happy. Um, now, this is the um, the set of that patient. Now, what I want to show you here is not really the increase in, in the airway. You'll, you'll notice behind the epiglottis, there is a slight um, increase in, in airway space, but that's really not what I want to show you here. What I want to show you is the patient still has lip seal. So they're wearing the device. They've been advanced one and a half millimeters, and they still have lip seal. The patient is not held open. And that's important. And I know I keep talking about lip seal, and I promise I will get to more of that in a few slides' time that will really explain why that's so important. This is how the device looks in the mouth. You know, there's, it's, it's very low profile, very, very thin on the lingual. The patient had quite a, quite a large tongue. You can almost see it through, popping through there. The vertical, we managed to keep that very low. Um, so the patient was very happy. Um, this is, of course, right on top of the, of the denture here. Um, so he is wearing that extra prosthesis, but but a very, very successful case. And, and again, thanks to Dr. Dunn for his uh, support with me on that one. So um, I'm not here to talk about PBS and allergy units, and you guys know how to take impressions. That's really not what, I'm, uh, what I want to show on this slide. I just want to say that th with the model side of things, I would really, you know, we still see this, and we still have some patients, some doctors taking the allergy and I know Algina can produce a great quality impression. The challenge is not there. The challenge is with the models being shipped by FedEx. And often they can get thrown around in the box and uh, damaged. And when the lab gets models that are damaged, like you'll see some of the, some of the lingual here and some of the, some of the book on the, the, that last molar, it, it, there's really a lot of guesswork here. So I would really encourage um, you to send a PVS or a digital scan of, of the cases. The one on the left-hand side here, obviously great detail. The, the gingival margins are so important because we're covering every surface of every tooth. So we really need to get that detail around the gingival because that's where we, um, that's where we uh, survey the undercuts and, and gauge the undercuts. So it's right for the patient and it fits obviously right and, and it's not too tight or too loose. Um, so that's enough of that. You guys can see this bit of the actual this. Um, so digital scan. Everybody wants to go digital. Everyone talks about digital. It's the new, obviously not even new, but it's the, it's the great thing that everyone's talking about. But there is a learning curve. And just because it's digital doesn't mean it's always going to be a better scan. The one on the left here, you can see that um, there's actually a few things wrong here, but 
One of the biggest is the double take that you see on the incisal edge of the upper central and lateral, and actually going on to the canine. So there's, there's some distortion there, which means that the device may not fit, and certainly then the bite is going to be off, because if the device is not going in, it's going to distort the bite, and the whole thing's going to be wrong. There's obviously a bit of a problem with the bite here as well. Um, this could be that the patient moved um, too much as the, as the side was being scanning. Maybe both sides weren't scanned accurately. Maybe just one side was scanned. I, I can't speak exactly why this happened, but it's certainly something to be aware of, of how important um, that bite scan is. On the right-hand side here, now from the, from the facial, this scan looks great, but as you start rotating it and, and tw twirling it like 360, there's a lot of holes there. Now, the lab can patch up small holes, but ones that's shown on the, on the, lower, um, uh, the lower left molar here really has a huge amount of distortion. So if you are taking digital scans, all I would ask is if you can get your team to rotate the scans, look at it from every angle, not just from the facial or the occlusal, rotate it as you would with a model and really kind of to, to check those out there. So, but, but as I said with the scans, the lab can accept pretty much every scan that you have. Um, and you can, you can email them at cadcam at moderndentalusa.com if you have any questions on the type of scanning uh, that you would like to send in. So next thing, modifications. How are we gonna modify these devices so that they can be customized for your patients? So hard versus hard soft. So the hard version is all acrylic, which is retained with ball clasps. The hard soft is a dual laminate material that doesn't have any ball clasps. That's the basics. How do we modify this? So on the hard version, there's several things that we can do here. Now, if we are gonna reduce the lingual coverage, we may lose some of that lingual retention. So what I would suggest is placing lingual ball clasps and re requesting that um, from, from the lab, and they can certainly do that. So if you're gonna do reduced lingual coverage, I would, I would have lingual ball clasps in there. Excuse me. The, um, the other option is that we don't have any ball clasps in there. And if you're confident enough on, on the retention side of things and don't mind doing a few adjustments chest size, then we can do it with no ball clasps in there. On the hard soft version, kind of the sim similar kind of message, the can we put ball clasps inside the soft material? We can, we can certainly do that. Um, I, I wouldn't always recommend it because you're breaking the seal of a soft material, which could in time over the course of a few years could cause some delamination. And um, the lab can try and seal it as best as possible, but um, it, it could cause that delamination. So I would, um, I would err on the side of caution of not doing the ball cast inside the hard soft material. But if you really would want it to be done, then we certainly can do it. So just again, again, anecdotal, what is everyone else using? What we find is the doctors who are just getting into it, want into dental team medicine, want to choose the hard soft because it's going to be an easier sell for the patient. There's less pressure on the teeth and it's a little bit more comfortable. What we find is the doctors who do high volume of this and, and actually the doctors who dedicate their practice, you know, almost exclusively to dental team medicine, I would say most of those do the hard or the EF to chrome version because of the longevity meaning that it, it's not a porous material like the soft is. Like any soft material is porous and we've all had the joys of smelling those hard soft night guards over the years. The hard version doesn't really have that because it doesn't have that, that porous material on the fitting surface. It also can be relined slightly if the patient has a new filling or a new crown, you can quite easily grind the soft, the, sorry, excuse me, you can quite easily grind the hard material. The soft material, you can do it if you'd like to do it, I would recommend using um, a heat resistant burr. I think that may be the, the green stripe burr with most manufacturers, and that can grind out some of that soft material. But the hard, much easier to bond acrylic to it, much easier to grind it, um, and less, uh, less of a porous material. So, um, you know, the, the same price, whichever, de whichever device of these two you choose, um, my recommendation would really be. Um, the hard, if you think that the patient doesn't have any sensitivity or any veneers that you're trying to perfect, um, that's just, again, anecdotal of what most of our clients are using. Uh, take it, take it uh, for what you will. So what happens if you take the bite position and you think, okay, well, I know that this is going to be a successful 
in opening up the airway, but is it gonna be comfortable for the patients? So what we can do in that scenario is create some retrusive ability in the screw. Now, if you remember from the earlier slides with the Respire Blue device, you can go um, six millimeters forward. You can't really go that much back. You can go maybe, you know, not even a quarter of a millimeter. So you really don't have much room to go back as a standard. But what we can build in there is say maybe one millimeter of retrusion. So if the, if the position is uncomfortable for the patient, that you can bring them back slightly to, to, to lessen off the pressure on the jaw. The only real downside of this is that if you are on a six millimeter screw and you start that screw two millimeters open, you then only have four millimeters to go forward. Now, four millimeters may be more than enough for you, but it also it might not be. Um, so I, my recommendation, if you're gonna do this, I would really do it at around about one millimeter of retrusion. So when you're taking your bite registration, you can bear that in mind that this is the position I'm gonna start at, but I can tell the lab, okay, I wanna back off slightly. Um, when you're taking that bite registration, by the way, one thing I would really recommend is once you've, once the material's set and you've trimmed all the excess material off, put it back in the patient's mouth and have them sit there for as, as much chair time as you can really give them, certainly for a few minutes. You certainly don't have to be there, but when you're taking that bite, it's very quick. There's a lot of moving parts. Everything's kind of moving, the material setting. But the patients often don't get the ability to feel, is this position comfortable? You know it's going to open their airway, and hopefully you do, um, but you don't know if it's comfortable. So getting them to sit there for a few minutes, it also will give you time to assess that midline shift, um, and it'll just really let you know, is the patient going to be comfortable in this? Because the last thing any of us want is the patient takes this device and, and finds it uncomfortable and either complains or just throws it away and, and doesn't continue treatment and has all of the ramifications that you have with pre-battening. So retrusive ability, long-winded answer, if possible, I'd recommend maybe one, one and a half millimeters. So on the EF, what can we do here? So as a standard, the EF device has C-clasps for retention. So the benefit to C-clasps is that it's, it's not getting in the in the proximals of the tooth, so it's not gonna separate the tooth at all. And it's wrapping that whole buccal surface and also the lingual surface for the lingual clasp on the, on the tooth. Now, we can modify those clasps as well. And if you'd like to have more lingual clasps and, uh, than buccal clasps, we can certainly do that. Usually with the lower, where we're getting the retention is on the lingual. And on the upper, it's often on the buccal of the molars. So having said that, then you can custom, customize the position of those clasps and even what type of clasp. So I have it listed here that you know, we can use ball clasps as, as, a, as a source of retention if you're not keen on the C-clasps. I really like the C-clasps because of the level of retention um, that you get with them. And it's not really impinging on the tooth quite as much, uh, certainly in the proximal. So that's an option on the clasp side of things. We also can close the anterior um, if you need to have more, if you want more acrylic on the anterior teeth, um, then we can do that. We can close the anterior off again. I'm getting back to lips there. Um, reduce lingual coverage. Um, now for the, we talked before about um, large tongue, crowding of the teeth, narrow arch. What we didn't really talk about is tori. And with tori, we obviously want to avoid those at all costs. So I would really recommend the EF design on this because you're really not going to go past the gingival margin on, on the lingual anyway. But on the acrylic, it's possible as well that we can reduce that, that that extension down so it's not impinging on the on the tori. So please recommend re request that from the lab if if you do have patients like this. And this is another extreme example of a reduced lingual coverage. I would only recommend something this extreme if you're very confident on those buccal undercuts because you've basically lost all retention on the lingual. But it's certainly an option as, as you as you're going through this. Now large tongues and reduced lingual coverage are a thing that we do every day and a big portion of our devices are doing it. We, we did a, um, a study with my good friend and colleague, Dr. Barry Chase in New York here, where we did around about 275, 275 patients was the end. And what we found is that 96% of those patients had a scalloped tongue and 83% of them had a Mal and Paddy score of 83%, meaning that there was virtually no space between their soft palate and, and the base of their tongue. So 
as you're screening your patients, this is a huge, huge tool is to look at the patient's tongue. Look at that scalloping, look at that Mal and Paddy score. And if, if over 275 patients, if 96% of them had a scalloped tongue, there's a chance that that patient may have some form of sleep apnea. So it's a great screening tool to use. And it also dictates how you're gonna design the appliance and whether you're gonna choose the EF because of the juice lingual, or you're gonna choose the acrylic to ask the lab to reduce it as much as possible. Great indicators for you uh, to keep an eye on. So we can provide these intraoral checklists for your team. Um, this is certainly a team-driven thing, certainly for the hygiene room. This is something that they can be keeping an eye on. Um, great indicators for, for anybody uh, who may have some form of sleep apnea, whether they have a retruded mandible, four by cuspid extractions, their neck size is another great screening tool to look for, narrow arch, Malin Paddy score. I think you guys get it. There's a lot of things that you can check out there uh, outside of the usual questionnaires of, are you tired during the day? Do you have morning headaches? That kind of thing. Elastic hooks and anterior bump. So anterior bump, first of all, acts as a discluding element on the upper component. This is to disclude the posterior. So it takes away that pressure and the, well, it takes away the ability, I should say, of the patient clenching. So a lot of our TMD doctors use it. Um, I know that there's a little bit of um, politics there be behind kind of an anterior discluding element device. Um, I'm not gonna get into that, but it's an option if you wanna take that, that ability for the patients to, to take away that ability for the patients to clench uh, and, to, uh, and, and to, to stress out that muscle of the muscle band. The next thing, elastic hooks. These are designed to guide the patient back to a closed position. And why is that important? It's important because of lip seal and nasal breathing. So I eventually hear, this is what I wanna show you of why it's important for lip seal. So this patient is undergoing a sleep endoscopy, a drug induced sleep endoscopy, which is, which is called a DICE procedure. And you'll see this patient is wearing the device. He's, he's obviously, um, he's going through the procedure. And this is a, this, this is an end study, but let me kind of at least play this video for you. Hopefully you can hear the sound. If not, there's not a great deal for you. So, as the patient is in a closed position there, I know he doesn't have perfect lip seal, um, but as he's in a closed position, he's doing much better. As he opens up, if you look at his neck in kind of his chest area, the seat, He's clearly going through an apnea event there, clearly can't breathe. And then you'll see you'll hear his heart rate kind of stabilizing as he, as he goes through that. And as his jaw drops open again, he, he stops breathing, goes into another apnea event. I mean, and that video was only, um, you know, what was that, 20, 20 seconds or so, 20, 30 seconds. Um, now, if this is happening every hour of a patient's sleep at night, the device is not being effective. And that's why it's so important for those elastic hooks. And I would really recommend them on, on almost all cases. And it's just guiding that patient back to a closed position. Or I should rephrase that. I recommend it on almost all cases for patients who sleep on their back. For patients who sleep on their side, less of a tendency to do that. Maybe it's not such of an issue. Another thing to advise you on is if the patient gets the device and they're doing really, really well, and then all of a sudden they stop doing quite as well. This may be one of the reasons. And we've seen this before where patients are doing really well and they get into that deep restful sleep and then their jaw falls open, it closes off their airway and then their sleep apnea comes back. So the elastic hooks is even something that you can add on after the fact if you're finding a patient is not doing quite as well as they used to do uh, or as, close, as good as they were doing. So let me go to the next slide, which this is really, um, this really gives you the, the better indication. So this is the endoscopy part of it. So same patient, same device, just to turn the lights off. This one. Hopefully you can hear it. Go through the same scenario. Down here, and you'll, see, you'll start to see the base of the tongue. 
and you can see there's hardly any space in here and the patient has a device in this room and the patient has a device in here. Going back to the controls and there we are. We have the patient depending on the soft pallet which is looking down on the boat. Hardly any space there and in just a second you'll see what happens when they close this door. And you see a wide open window. And there it goes again, wide open that's the difference between having the patient being closed and having their door fall open. Much, much wider airway. It almost, it almost doesn't look like the same patient, right? As, you, as the patient's jaw is falling open there, and then they bring them in the, to that closed position, they get that lift seal, and then it's, it's allowing that, that, uh, that airway to open. Now, of course, when we're trying to encourage the patients to breathe through their, breathe through their nose because when you're breathing through your nose, the paranasal sinus is releasing nitric oxide. And that nitric oxide is dilating the blood vessels, getting more oxygen into the bloodstream, which is allowing that better quality of night's sleep, which is ultimately what we're trying to achieve here. So lip seal is important for, 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 for that as well. And we're trying to promote that nasal breathing. There's other things you can do, of course. I know some doctors, Dr. Dunn, whose, whose slides I showed a few slides ago, he uses... Um, uh, like surgical tape and taping the patient's lips together. That's certainly not for night one, but as you're going through the treatment and you're looking for better success, it's maybe an option to try to encourage, to really encourage that, 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 uh, that lip seal. So titration. This is, um, I'm kind of running short on time here. I'm coming up towards the hour, so I don't want to kind of watch the video. Um, this is basically how you advance the device. I can send this. It's quite straightforward. Um, let me just play a quick second of it. And Dr. Yeah. We take the key in the lower hole and we bring it up on the right side. Both sides is about a 90 degree turn and it will stop the key at that turn. Five turns equal one millimeter. Another thing we want to know as a practitioner is that we have a maximum of six millimeters of protrusive position. On the left side of the appliance, the arrow that's in yellow is in the red acrylic, the yellow arrow, and it points in the downward direction. So we want to take the key into the top hole and push it down. Both sides is about a 90 degree turn and it will stop the key at that turn. If you want to find out any more information, you can go to Whole U's website or give them a call. Thank you. Hopefully that was quite clear. And for the, the spire ping, it's a very similar titration mechanism. You place the key in the hole, turn it in the direction of the arrow, quite straightforward. The new device that we're going to be launching next month has a whole new different mechanism for advancing. Um, so I, I'll be happy to share that with you guys next month. So troubleshooting on, in the last few minutes, what do we do here? The patient has an open bite. You probably immediately think the lab didn't set it at the bite. What are they doing? They don't know what they're doing. They didn't articulate it correctly. But what actually was the case in this situation is not that the, the bite was wrong. It's actually the fit was wrong. So when the patient was um, taking this device in and out, it was super, super tight. Now on the anterior there, on the right hand side, you see that it fit perfectly. Now, what it wasn't doing, though, it wasn't fitting over the distal of the last molar. Whether that was because the impression detail wasn't great or the lab estimated where the, the, the extension was, whatever it was, it wasn't fitting over the distal of that last molar, which is causing the bite to be off. So if you see this situation, please don't think automatically that the bite's off. It could well be the fitting of the device. Either it's not fully seating over the teeth or, or it hasn't sat down behind the distal of that last molar, or it's just so tight that it's not fully going over those undercuts. Um, so a few things to, to look out for before you send it back to the, to the lab. Another thing is the midline shift. So you look at this one and you think, okay, on the articulator, models are perfect. On the appliance, sorry, excuse me, midline is perfect. On the appliance, midline is perfect. Goes inside the patient's mouth, patient's way off to one side. What, what went wrong here? The fact is the patient actually needed to be in that position. It was the bite was taken incorrectly and the dentist forced the patient back to that midline position where they really didn't need to be in that position. So the patient's naturally wanting to go to their natural midline shift, whether that's a, you know, a, a, an issue with their condyles or whatever it may be. Um, so please keep an eye on that midline. It could well be that the patient actually needs to be slightly off to one side if that's more their comfort position. The only reason you're going to, the only way you're going to know that, honestly, is if you give the patient back that bite and let them sit there for a few minutes and you, and you kind of measure 
exactly where they should be versus where they are. Now, there's a lot of other special requests, a lot of other preferences that we can talk through. I, I am running out of time, so I, I don't have enough time to talk about them now, but you have a team of people here to support you. Um, if any questions, um, I'm certainly more than happy to, to answer them either right now or certainly afterwards, I'll pass my email address out. But there's a lot of options around modifications that we can talk about, and I'm more than happy to do that. So in the words of my friend, Dr. John Tucker, that he feels that dental sleep medicine is where dental implants were 30 years ago, and in our profession has a quintessential impact on changing patients' life more than ever before, and I couldn't have said it better myself. So that is everything from me, the contact information for myself, Teresa and Modern, uh, the websites, everything is on there. But I'd just like to thank everybody for their time, right on time at eight o'clock. Um, and thank you for the team of Microdental and Modern USA for hosting this. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, David, for that informative presentation. Uh, we will now transition into the QA section of the webinar. Uh, let's see what questions we have for you. All right, here's one. Can we request reduced lingual coverage on any design? Um, pretty much, yes. Um, the, the EF designs, as I think I mentioned, um, they come as a standard. All of, the, all of them have reduced lingual coverage. Um, on the acrylic designs, yes, we can, we can modify any one of those. But I would stress that um, keep an eye on those undercuts on the lingual of the lower, because if we, if we, don't, um, if we don't engage those undercuts, we are going to lose some retention. But to answer the question, yes, we, we could essentially customize it to any design. Okay, and then the next question is, um, remind us again of the design needed when the patient has a high curve of speed. So if the patient has a high curve of speed to um, request mesial occlusal rests on, on the last molar. Um, the lab may actually uh, reach out to you guys, um, but again, just because you have the space in the anterior doesn't mean that it's enough in the posterior to make the device. So please keep an eye on that posterior, but the mesial, mesial occlusal rest. Okay, and then let's see, the next question is, uh, how can we order a starter kit? So yeah, it's Risa at Modern can help you guys get started. Um, she can send out all the information that you guys would, whether it's a, you guys are requesting demo devices or shipping labels, supplies. Teresa's email is on the screen. I'm sure she'd be more than happy to, to get you guys started with a, with a starter kit. Okay, and then um, I have a question here says, what does EF stand for, please? Sorry, the EF is Endurance Framework. So that's the Chrome framework uh, designs that we talked about. So EF is for endurance framework. Okay, and then uh, lastly, let's see, we have what is your turnaround time? So the turnaround time is um, usually for digital cases, it's around um, 10 days, uh, so two weeks. And for traditional impressions or models, it's closer to three weeks. And there is options to slightly rush those if, if needed. But um, for those doing digital, it's around, uh, it's around 10 days. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, David. Um, to our attendees, I'd like to say that uh, please be on the lookout for a promo in your emails in the coming days for your our appreciation for you attending this webinar. Um, thank you again, David. It was very informative. I'm sure our attendees enjoyed it. And um, also another reminder for our attendees to please be sure to complete the CE evaluation form that will appear after you exit Zoom this evening. Um, and be on the lookout for the recordings on our website. Uh, thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.